Well, welcome back to another episode of the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Jack O'Brien. Thank you again for joining us for another episode. As always, we don't take it for granted that you would spend the next 30, 45, 60 minutes sharing your earphones with us. So thank you for joining us. Today, we have another guest on the podcast, and this one's been a long time coming, and I must admit, I was a little bit excited at the time of recording. Uh, I've followed this gentleman for a number of years, and I would suggest that you park the car, take notes. This is going to be one for the ages. Dr. Dan Pronk, welcome to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. How are you, mate? Excellent, Jack. Thank you kindly for the opportunity to be on the show. It is our pleasure. So, folks, Dan has uh, a quite a, che- a coloured past. I won't say checkered, but coloured past from uh, uh, semi elite sports through the military as a doctor and now author. Uh, why don't we start at the top, Dan? Like, tell us about your book firstly, and let's get that out there. How can people perhaps um, understand a little bit more about the research and the book that you've uh, published? Yeah, cheers, Chad. The- so the, the book is titled The Resilient Shield, and it's a, a pretty long story how we came to write that. I've co-authored it with another two uh, SAS veterans, my brother Ben Pronk and uh, Tim Curtis is the, the third author there. And so the, the three of us cumulatively went through careers uh, doing different things with the military, gravitating towards the SAS. Both Ben and Tim were infantry officers and, and served as officers at all levels in the SAS, including Ben commanding the unit. And so they had that experience in special operations at a time when things were in high tempo overseas operationally. So it was a really privileged time to be in the military. And and my experience with the unit was as the doctor. So I got a different perspective there and and once again had the the opportunity to get overseas and and gain some experience. And then cumulatively, uh, we all uh, when we all got out of the the regiment and left the military, we all went and did uh, MBAs. And so we've sort of got this common thread to our past. And, and then as we all negotiated our post-discharge transition to civilian life, uh, we, we all had our challenges, as you do. We sort of had a significant loss of purpose, probably myself more so than Ben and Tim. And mm-hmm. I had a few wobbles there with my, uh, with my mental health, to be perfectly honest. A lot of stuff I hadn't processed while I was with the military caught up with me a little and it got me really intrigued in this this construct of resilience and basically in a nutshell why all of us in the the special operations and the the broader military community were were able to as a generalization function really well in these high stress high threat environments at the time Mm -hmm. and then it seemed that it wasn't until most of us discharged that we started to to have some troubles and so just really analyzing that from a personal perspective a psychological and physiological perspective, looking at, at what it all meant. And out of that fell a deep dive into resilience and why people within high performance teams and constructs where they, their values are aligned with what they're doing can stay resilient despite significant stress and why that might be uh, sort of fall away from you when you leave those dynamic high performance team environments. Amazing, mate. So, folks, I can't recommend the Resilience Shield enough. Uh, Dan, if people want to buy the book or uh, or visit a website, where should they go? Our, our website is resilientshield.com. So that's a, a good place to start. We've got a blog there with a bunch of articles and we've got an online shop where you can buy the book, including signed copies if, uh, if you happen to want that. It will be available as of the 27th of July in Australian and New Zealand bookstores in hard copy and it'll be available internationally on that same date in audio book and in electronic book so for international anyone listening overseas or if you want uh, the audio book you can find it on audible and other audio book uh, retailers perfect and folks we'll link all that up in the show notes over at clinicmastery.com slash podcast where you can head for all the usual uh, usual suspects when it comes to these episodes. So, Dan, we're going to walk through the timeline of your journey from sports through the military, medicine, and uh, now this work on resilience. But before we go down that rabbit hole, I've got a couple of quick icebreaker questions. So, number one, what are you reading right now? I'm currently reading Jordan Peterson's uh, follow-up book from his 12 Rules of Life. I, I, I love the guy. I, I, I think he's a, a breath of fresh air when it comes to psychology i love his philosophies i love his his conviction to his opinion and uh, and everything behind it so that's that's on the go and i've just recently finished a book by a very good friend of mine mark wales called survivor so mark 
uh, some of your audience might might know of. He's a, a also an SAS veteran who has has gone on to do uh, bigger and better things in his life post military. So yeah, Mark Wales Survivor is a great read for anyone interested. We're going to see you on Survivor one day, mate, or what? Ah, who knows? Who knows? Stranger, <laughs> stranger things have happened. I might be getting a bit old for that sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, number two, mate. Who inspires you? Oh, look, I'm, I'm inspired broadly, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I guess, okay, let's go from the top. I, I love Stoic philosophies. I'm, I'm hugely inspired by the, the Stoic philosophies. I'm inspired by, uh, there's a, there was a bloke who, uh, by the name of, of Richard Villa, who wrote a book called Knife Edge, very small uh, sort of publication in the UK. He was a British SAS uh, doctor. And when I was going through my pathway to trying to join special forces as a doctor I, I came across his book and then him personally and and so he's been hugely inspirational there's a long list of people that had inspired me throughout my military career that wouldn't wouldn't be known to the general public but these are the selfless folk that invested countless hours uh, into my development as a doctor to allow me to to do the job that I do my kids are pretty inspirational I, I can't lie to you they drive me uh, crazy, but uh, they're pretty inspirational. And look, I've got to say my wife, she's, um, God bless her, she has been the absolute foundation of, of me as a human being in my adult life and, and uh, our family, particularly when I was de deploying. But yeah, look, I draw inspiration from a, a really wide range of, of people across sporting, professional uh, domains, and, and, and even the, you know, I, I had the opportunity to work in the prison system for a few years and, and found a lot of the people that I dealt with there quite inspirational as well, just for the simple fact that they were uh, trying to do the best they could when they, when life just dealt them a really crappy hand of cards. Wow. Finally, mate, what, what's a motto that you live by? Well, there's lots. I've got a bunch of these actually spray painted in a stencil on my weightlifting platform. I do a bit of Olympic lifting. And so I've, I've got the, the key ones uh, stenciled on that but the the number one in the list there is always a little further which has got it comes from a a, um, a, a passage called the, the golden journey to Samarkand by James Elroy Flecker and it's got some significance in particularly British SAS history but always a little further I think is just a fantastic motto just small incremental movements in the right direction it's not shiny it's not sexy it's not these massive leaps from from zero to hero but but it is what I have found has gotten me you know any of the successes I might have had in in my life have just been from chipping away at things uh, day in day out and and uh, so yeah always a little further I think is probably mm -hmm. the head of the list there it's not the critic who counts would come in a, a close second from uh, mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt's uh, yeah, famous Roosevelt, passage. Yeah. yeah. Man in the arena. Love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nailed it. Uh, awesome, mate. Well, connect the dots for us. I'm, I'm sure you didn't. Well, well, I know I've read, read a few of the books, but did you grow up wanting to, uh, to be an SAS soldier or, or what was the plan once you finished school? What was uh, Dan Pronk's big aspirations? Yeah, look, they, they weren't, well, probably they, my initial aspirations were to either be a panel beater or a commercial artist, if I'm being honest with you. I wasn't very scholarly at, at, uh, at school, didn't do particularly well, had a great time. Uh, grew up in a military family, so we moved around a lot and had a, a somewhat, I guess, disrupted uh, schooling, if you like. Went to 10 schools in the end. And, and so towards the, the latter part of my high schooling, became very interested in athletics. Couldn't, couldn't tell you how I got into that, to be honest, but um, started running middle distance. Loved I guess, it. mate, as, a, as an average 70 kilo dickhead, yeah. in your own words, probably, probably contact sports were out of the picture, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I would have got squashed playing any contact sports. Uh, yeah, I've, I've not ever uh, been a contact <laughs> sport person. You've got to, got to play to your strengths and, and uh -huh. a man needs to know his limitations. But right. yeah, you're quite right. Never, never into the contact sports. So the, and the individual sports seem to be my thing. I, I'm actually, despite kind of chewing your ear off here on the podcast, I'm a pretty introverted sort of a bloke and, and enjoy uh, sort of solo activities. And so middle distance running was just a, a great fit for me at the time. Uh, got into the, the 1500 and at the time my heroes were the, the, the famous mile runners of the time, the, mm -hmm. the um, Ichim El Garouges and, and those sort of types who were, were smashing it. And so I, I finished school, by the time I finished school, I'd gotten into triathlon, which was a pretty fledgling sport at that time. That was the mid 90s. And 
was got, got bitten by the triathlon bug and moved to the Gold Coast. I My school exit scores were good enough to get into exercise science at, uh, at and did that. So I took a year off and, and uh, focused on my athletics and triathlon, then went and did some uni part-time over a number of years and got an exercise science degree while I was trying to crack it as a professional triathlete. Uh, the triathlon thing was never going to happen. With hindsight, I simply just was not good enough and, and probably didn't have the, the mental grit for it. Looking back, it just wasn't there at the time. So that, that kind of uh, fell through, had a sports science degree or exercise science degree and was basically hit a point where I was in my early 20s and thought, gee, where to now? I looked at what I could do with this exercise science degree. At the time, it wasn't much. And I was looking at either continuing down your pathway, Jack, to be a physio uh, or medicine was the other option, postgraduate medical studies. So I, I started sort of looking at both of those, sat the medical school entrance exam a- around the same time, realised I was going to need to make a crust. And so <laughs> I started to look at the army. I'd, I'd come from a, an army family. My dad was an army helicopter pilot. My brother at that time had joined the army and was going down his officer training. And so it was familiar to me, started to look to sign up and and all of that eventually came together in an army scholarship to go and study medicine, which is what set me down that pathway. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't until the end of my first year of medical school, uh, by which time my brother Ben had done SAS selection and was with the uh, Special Air Service Regiment getting ready to go to Afghanistan. So the the first year of med school for me was 01. The end of 01 was, of, of course, when September 11th happened and the Twin Towers fell. And so that was the, the first time I went to see Ben before he deployed and uh, got a look at, at what the SAS regiment was all about, met some of his mates. And, and that was a real light bulb moment for me. That was a, a, a new focus. So from that point, end of 01, I decided that I'd, I'd love to get myself into the SAS regiment. And so from 01 then, how long was it till you got your beret? Yeah, look, well, actually, to, to be honest, I never got the beret. So the, the, that's, a, that's a long story as well. I talked to that in, uh, in average 70 kilo dickhead in a, in a chapter titled The Elusive Sandy Beret. But uh, for, for a variety of reasons, I never, I never did enough of what, what's called reinforcement training. So the courses that you do after the selection course to get fully qualified. But um, it, it was not until 2008 that I was in a position to do the SAS selection course. So I did it in 08 uh, I, because I, I needed to finish my medical schooling. I had to do two years as a junior civilian doctor and then do my, my induction courses into the army, which took about 12 months. So it was, a, yeah, it was seven odd years before I, mm. I kind of fulfilled that initial uh, dream of setting foot on the SAS selection course. Uh, was was fortunate enough to to get through that and pop out the other end, and that that led me into the special operations world. Uh, but yeah, never never ticked that box to wear the the sandy beret in the end. <laughs> so yeah, tell me a little bit about medicine in those early days and in the civilian training, etc. Do you still feel like you identify yourself as a health professional? I know a lot of the clinic owners that we deal with, it's their first love, it's what they studied and maybe they've progressed on to leading teams and running businesses, but deep down they're still a physio or still a psychologist. Do you feel that affinity with your original profession? Look, I, I probably don't feel it to the same strength as some of my colleagues. And I think some of that stems out of, I've, I've reflected on this quite a lot and some of it stems out of the fact that it was never my lifelong aspiration I was the the thought of becoming a doctor never occurred to me until I was 21 22 years old and and then it was kind of well I'll give this a go and then holy holy dooly I got through the entrance exam and I can and so it was sort of that was the first time it occurred to me so and and don't get me wrong I I don't mean to sound uh, ungrateful it's it's an absolutely fantastic career I loved being a doctor with the army. I loved practicing medicine in that environment. Mm-hmm. And I've certainly had some, some hugely professionally rewarding experiences as a doctor outside of the army and am and, uh, and very, very grateful uh, to have that the chips fell the way they did and I ended up with this qualification. But that said, the, you know, I'm, I'm very uh, drawn to the entrepreneurial side of things, the business side of things. I've, I've loved the writing process. And so... I think um, while I still do sort of 
part of my identity is very strongly linked to medicine. It's it's only a part, and there's there's mm. a whole bunch of other facets there. So maybe tell us a couple of uh, couple of stories. We don't need to go down them all, but from the time in the military, for those who are unfamiliar, the the SAS regiment or Special Air Service regiment is the tip of the spear. I think Dan's often referred to. These are the these are the guys on the front lines doing um, doing the soldiering out where we don't hear about it much back in the public. And so, what is a what is a medic role in the SAS look like? Yeah, I guess just to talk to that tip of the spear thing, it's it is something that gets used. It's something that that I don't love, and and it may be true. And I, I think you know when you when you're acknowledging the the tip of the spear, it's important to recognise all the groups like the second commando regiment, the special operations engineers, the special operations logistics. But but I, I like to think of the, the the tip of the spear. Yeah, sure, it might be where the spear interacts with the enemy, but without the rest of the spear, that tip's pretty useless. And so yeah, sure. I, I, I sort of it, it does. The SAS regiment does. Uh, you know, get a lot of attention. I think there's a lot of aura that surrounds it, and and obviously it's it's getting uh, sort of all sorts of different types of attention in the media at the moment. But coming back to your question, the 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 role of a the the medical element, the medical troop, which consisted of of the medics, and and uh, I sort of had the privilege of of being the the doctor in that construct, was basically provide medical support to the full spectrum of special operations, and so the that ranged from a whole bunch of things. You, you could be in barracks just doing the day-to-day -day stuff. There was a lot of training uh, when we weren't operational. When we were operational, it was fundamentally as the doctor doing a, on a day-to-day -day basis, doing a GP role, keeping the guys in, uh, in good health when we were in barracks. And then when we projected forward out onto a target, it was, it was being close enough to the any casualties at the point of injury, be it gunshot or blast, and then having the skill set and also the tactical competence to be able to provide appropriate life-saving interventions at the point of injury to preserve life and 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 facilitate a, a medical evacuation. And so, you know, it was it was a, a a vast range of roles, and and then the it was complicated by the the wide range of of tasks that a group like the SAS regiment or any special operations element gets. And so, I mean, you have to fit in with the mission. The mission it has primacy and a casualty on the mission is becomes a logistical issue that you are there to solve. And so it, it was that, uh, yeah, very, very, very interesting role. When you when you look back on some of those tours, maybe fill us in on uh, where you've been and, and how many times you've been to those places, but uh, what are you most proud of? Look, I, I think I'm, I'm most proud of, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of it. I'm, I'm very lucky that the stars aligned that I was in the right roles to, to go to places like Afghanistan. I did four special operations tours of Afghanistan uh, over my time in the military, spent some time in Timor. But I think when I reflect, the, the thing I'm most proud of is probably the training of, of other medics and operators in in tactical medicine which then had a flow-on effect of them being able to step up in in pretty complicated situations and and provide life saving interventions would would probably be when it boils down to it i egotistically spent the first sort of tour or two thinking that i needed to be the guy there and and uh, realised after a couple of incidents on my second, or maybe my third, I can't remember, but somewhere in there that, mm. that where I wasn't there and the medics did a spectacular job or the operators did a brilliant job, I realised, hey, hang on, I'm not as important as I'd like to think I am here. <laughs> and probably my, my most uh, important role is to facilitate good training of, of everyone. And, and I really had a change of, of uh, mindset there. And so, yeah, when I reflect, I'd, I'd like to think that I played a small part in facilitating training of people who were then able to, to step up and, and make a, a hugely, uh, on occasion, life-saving uh, difference to, to another soldier. So that's probably where, where most of my pride is. I, I love that. Uh, and firstly, on, on behalf of all listeners, thank you for your service. But I think that there's a lot of uh, parallels between those situations that you're describing and clinicians who often pride themselves on being the, you know, the magic hands that help people in pain or the go-to therapist. And 
Uh, and then that evolution as a clinic owner to then leading teams that, you know, we talk about at Clinic Mastery to amplify your impact. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've been able to do with, with part of your role uh, while you're deployed, but also now I know you come back with some of the tourniquets and those types of um, types of things that you've really been able to leave a legacy, right? Oh, look, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I try and steer away from those leave a legacy. I think maybe hold the baton while I was in the position and, and hopefully hand it on well to the, the next generation to head in, in a direction that they think is the right one to head. And, you know, I, I, was only able to do what I did and it, because, as I said before, there was a whole bunch of people that had gone before me that, that invested in me and I, I'd like to think that I, I have invested adequately in the, the next crew to come along and, and kind of maintain that momentum. But you, you're exactly right, Jack, in that the... And this is something that, that Ben, Tim and I have discussed at length and is really fundamental in the Resilient Shield project is there's so many parallels and we look at what happened in the, what was familiar to us being the SAS environment and the deployed environment. And there's specifics to that environment, of course, but the fundamental principles are universal across the board when it comes to things like leadership, management, resilience, stress. And, and it's been very exciting to us to be able to just distill down our lessons learned and do the best we can to then try and make them relevant to a, a broader uh, community of high performance teams and leaders and then try and get that information across and, and take the lessons learned from the battlefield, if you like, and apply them to the, the boardroom to, to wherever else. I love it. I know personally, I've, I've learned so much from, um, from special operations and, uh, and the lessons and, and leadership that can be extracted from that. So talk to us then how we ended up at a place writing a book about a resilience shield. <laughs> what happens from uh, being discharged from the military through to writing a book? Well, when I got out, I, I sort of had a bit of a rocky path and, and a lot of it, I, I, I loved the way you guys uh, talk about, you know, purpose in, in a lot of your material that really sort of uh, struck me. And, and I, I realized with hindsight that I had a huge amount of purpose in the military and, and I, I got out, I naively thought that when I got out, things were going to be pretty smooth sailing, that I'd be safer than ever. I'd be home, had a very young family at the time, had been away a lot. And my wife was, was uh, sort of had the stress of raising the kids herself. And also, you know, cumulatively over all of our tours of Afghanistan, you start to lose mates and, and you start to see the consequence of, of other mates that were injured, losing limbs, these kind of things. And so the, the reality of what we were doing uh, really started to hit home to me. And so, I mean, it was, it was time to get out and all I saw was the positives. And it, it really uh, blindsided me a little, the, the paradox of when I did get out in my first year out of the military, I, I really sort of struggled. I struggled for purpose. I, I lost my identity with hindsight. My identity was fused with my role as a doctor with the army. That's right. that I was so invested there. And so I'd lost this purpose and, and this, this sense of being. And, and it was at that stage that the, the cumulative kind of trauma that I didn't really even register that I needed to process, to be honest, it, it, it was um, sort of, and, and this was the, the, the loss, loss of mates, people, mates of mine that I'd responded to in the field when they'd been um, shot or, uh, or hit improvised explosive devices and I couldn't save. You know, these were the, the there, were, there was some, some, for me, hugely uh, significant events that, that because the, the machine just kept churning and moving on, you, you, you didn't have a lot of time to process things. And, and in a way, the distraction of being part of such a fast moving machine was great in that you didn't have to process it, you know, and, sure. and but, but at some point you, you got to hop off that, uh, that, that train. And, and when I did, when I discharged was when some of that stuff started to catch up with me. And, and then I, I kind of uh, really just, just struggled for a bit and, and struggled to find purpose, struggled with my identity as a civilian and, and just had not, not a lot of fun for a couple of years. And, and it just seemed like a real uh, paradox in that I was safer than ever, earning more money than ever. I was home with my wife and young family. Things on paper were fantastic. And yet in practice, I wasn't going as well as I had been when I was deploying to environments where, where um, you know, there was a, a lot of risk and, and threat and pressure. And, and so that got me looking into, I was living it as a human being, but, but then I was looking at it through the lens of a, a doctor with a scientific mind saying, what, what, sure. what the hell is happening here with a, the goal of trying to 
codify it, if you like, and, and finding some clues, some, some pathway back to a, a good place. And as I went along and, and, and I started sort of reaching out on social media and, and just writing down my thoughts and capturing them and, and realizing that there was, you know, thousands of, of people around the, the uh, world feeling the same thing when they discharged from the military. So it started to resonate, which fueled my interest in engaging uh, Ben and Tim had, had gotten out of the military and they were negotiating their transition to civilian life. And the, the three of us came together to start doing some presentations to start. And then we, we sort of thought, you know, we, we looked at, as we were doing more and more presentations, how to present this construct that we were trying to talk about. And, sure. and it became clear that, that resilience was a massive factor, that the, the construct of the SAS regiment bolstered resilience for a variety of reasons uh, as individuals for members of that unit or any high performance team uh, or, you know, business entity, these, any, any uh, sort of team that you're highly invested in will bolster that resilience. And, and it became clear that that fell into different categories. And so we started to uh, actually, Ben came up with the idea of the shield because uh, it fits with resilience. And it, it just, we, we started to put together these layers of the shield to be able to present them individually and then look at the evidence base uh, tagged onto that, we got a government research grant to do our own uh, research survey and projects to capture data and look at resilience and validate the resilience shield model. And so it sort of all gained momentum as we've gone along. I, I love it. I want to press into more of the the layers of this shield and and the contents of the book. Like I said, I've been following for a long time, and for me, it it feels like the final piece of the puzzle when I think about some of the more popular concepts that especially clinic owners would be familiar with, you know, Brene Brown's kind of vulnerability stuff and Angela Duckworth's grit. And it just, it pulls it all together in this kind of sh really, uh, th this shield that just makes so much sense. So can you maybe talk to us about uh, what are some of the layers that make up the resilient shield? Yeah, absolutely. So it breaks down into six layers. So we've got the innate layer, which is your, your fundamental, your nature and nurture, the genetics, how you've been raised, how you've, what stressors you've faced over your life and how you've risen to those occasions, uh, but also constructs that uh, we widely think of as largely fixed things like your personality, those, those uh, kind of things. The, the mind layer comes next and there's no... Uh, sort of it's it is put there for the very reason that that it is absolutely fundamental and interestingly it's um, the mind layer survey questions broke our research study in that it was so important and so positively correlated and causative of resilience that it was pretty much a proxy for resilience it just swamped everything else which has been very interesting but that's just looking at at, at any uh, anything that basically bolsters your mindfulness. I mean, there's uh, meditative practices, engagement in activities where you can get into a flow state. So being absorbed in something and, you know, that doesn't need to be adrenaline sports and jumping out of planes and gunfighting and these kind of things. It's, and, and, you know, nowadays I find my flow states trying to learn a piano, doing woodworking, cooking, anything that just engages you and you can, you can get involved in. And that's, there's some interesting uh, functional MRI studies that show that a brain in the flow state, and and actually, if anyone's interested in that, there's the, look up the research by by Mihai Chixon Mihai, who's the bloke who came up with the flow state. It took me ages to learn that bloke's name. <laughs> I thought I'd try and get it out there, but but uh, Chixon Mihai talks to he's the he's the the guru of the flow state, and 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 religion and spirituality all comes into the mind layer. But it's very very important, very important for your overall resilience. The body layer comes next, and so that's your your health and your fitness, which won't be a surprise to any listener that the healthier you are and the fitter you are, the more globally resilient you are. But what we've aimed to really uh, distill down in the book is some some things you might not have have thought as obvious. So sleep optimization strategies, things like blue light discipline, making sure that you're uh, monitoring your blue light, particularly inputs late in the evening to make sure your melatonin gets released and you can get into mm -hmm. your deep sleep and, and get your REM state uh, there. You, you're tracking the sleep. There's a great quote by a, uh, um, a management guru called Peter Drucker that says you, you can't improve what you can't track and and so or what you can't measure and so I mean lots of people will go to bed wake up in the morning some days feel good other days they won't and and 
if you're tracking your sleep, you can start to really codify that and then look at what behaviours were leading to those sleep patterns. And we, we talk about caffeine and alcohol and how it impacts your sleep, chronic stress, how that impacts your sleep and, and just starting to try because, I mean, it's, a, it's a, some of the literature talks about sleep deprivation as a, as a, a sort of epidemic uh, in this day and age. And mm -hmm. everyone's getting busier. Everyone's staring at screens until late at the night and drinking too much coffee and alcohol. And, and just these, once again, this always a little further, small steps in the right direction to optimize sleep and, and health and fitness. That's all the body layer. Then we look at the, the social layer, which uh, as it sounds is your social support. Once again, bit of a, a no brainer there that if you've got good social support, you're going to be more resilient. If there's a, a, a people around you that you can uh, fall back on and have uh, intimate conversations with and debrief with, uh, then that helps through tough times. But just once again, drilling down into the detail of what does that look like and how do you optimize that on a day-to-day -day fashion to, to build bigger, uh, stronger overall resilience. Then you've got the professional layer, which looks at, at as it sounds, you, how you fit into your profession. And, and this has got a whole bunch of facets onto, as to how you can, I mean, ideally we'll be in occupations where our values are congruent with what we do at work and, and we'll work with a whole bunch of people that we really like and we'd be happy to socialise with. But that's, that's a bit of a panacea. And so we try and talk to ways that you can optimise your professional experience, acknowledging that we spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, each month of our lives in the workplace and if there are suboptimal sort of facets of your work life how you can just look to to take control and 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 make the most of that despite them not being completely aligned with what you'd love your work to be and on top of this uh, around the outside of that and it's important to acknowledge that while we deal with the individual layers uh, as as that separate layers that we, we we go to great lengths to describe the fact that they're all interwoven and so we okay. talked about there's a there's a story in there actually that relates to a an afghan rug and the strength of the weave and this is a, a story that's a, a vignette in the book that comes from a place called chicken street in uh, in kabul afghanistan where you buy rugs and and the, the the crux of the story is that the afghan rug dealers we're all interested in what it looks like from the top but they always want to flip the rug over to show you the weave right. which is ugly and it's knotted but that's where the quality of the of the rug comes from it's the, the the strength of the weave and and we use this analogy for the resilient shield it's it's not the individual layers it's all of them woven together in proportion and then the final layer is what we call adaptation and it, it sits around the resilient shield in a model and mm -hmm. it is basically the ability to approach a novel stressor with confidence so so how do you deal with in a complex world where you get thrown these uh, wicked problems is the terminology they use in complexity theory. These wicked problems, there's no precedent. They're damned if you do, damned if you don't. How do you build resilience towards something that you couldn't possibly have seen coming? Right. And, and that's this adaptation. And, and the more you build your individual layers, the stronger the adaptation layer becomes and the more confident you can be to use your existing resilience against a, a novel task. Sorry, mate, I'm chewing your ear off there. That's great. I'm thinking wicked sounds just like the last 18 months of the uh, COVID kind oh, of situation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, look, there's, I mean, there's, there's differing opinions as to whether COVID fits the uh, wicked problem or whether we should have able to see it coming but either way here it is and if you're not prepared for a particular stress or then it is a uh, a sort of challenge without precedent that you need to apply uh, your resilience against and so yeah it does it does in effect fit that description of a, a novel problem so each of these layers appreciate you describing them it sounds like we can work on them to varying degrees uh based on where we score there's a, there's a test or a survey right that we can measure how we uh, how we measure up in each of those degrees if i was to ask you if you had a layer to choose that you'd prefer to work on you enjoy working on fine comes easy what does what does dan prompt choose to work on look the, the the problem with that question is the ones that come easy are the ones we're going to favor because they're the ones we're already good at and so uh -huh. they're the ones we need to strengthen right. so, I mean, for me i I love to get out and exercise and, and, you know, throw a couple of weights around and ride my bike and go for a run and stuff. But I know that physically, and you, you're quite right, we've got a resilient survey that if you go to resilientshield.com, you can do that survey. And what it does is just quantifies your resilience across those layers that you can 
that you can modify and you can change and work on. And the goal is not to find your strengths and go with it or do the things that you find uh, come easiest to you. Mm. The goal is to look at the areas where you are relatively not as strong and work on them. And it's like kind of diversifying a share portfolio, if you like. If, if you've got a whole bunch of shares in BHP and they're going well, then you're rich. Problem is, if you haven't diversified in BHP tanks, then you're poor. And so the idea is to try and balance your, your resilient shield and say, so look at the areas of relative weakness and look at how to in, improve them. But the, the one that I have found in the last few years and is just has been an absolute game changer for me is the, the, the meditation. And I never thought I would find myself being a, a, an advocate of meditation. I, I had had it presented to me numerous times during my uh, professional careers and always sort of fobbed it off. And, and it wasn't until I started trying it because, uh, you know, nothing else was really working well for me in those years post-discharge that it, it was just an absolute game changer. And so, you know, the mind, and we know this, I mean, uh, our research shows it, but also the, the literature uh, more and more and, and with the ability to scan brains and look at the, the actual physical changes in brains of meditators in terms of their impulse control and their stress response uh, neural, uh, neural networks, but also the, the way that they fire. So their brain activation under stress, uh, their ability for meditators to, to have, uh, you know, diminished pain responses and these sort of things. It's, the evidence is overwhelming now. It's, it's gone to the days of just some um, sort of hippie mung bean telling you to do it because you feel good. This is, this is next level human performance. And, and I fear that a lot of people, particularly the warrior culture, particularly the young bulletproof males wandering around in all walks of life, are missing this, this unbelievable opportunity to, to optimise their overall human performance. Yeah, interesting. What do you say, Dan, to those perhaps listening and going, oh, here we go, another <laughs> survey, and it's just an, <laughs> just another personality test. It's, uh, yeah. it's another pop culture. I know there's so much research that's gone into this particular project, and, and I know that the evidence base will really resonate with health professionals. But what do you say to that when oh, it's just another one of these tests? Oh, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. if you're not, what, makes it, what makes it different? Don't do it. Yeah, go, go, go surf social media. But um, no, I mean, it's, uh, I think inherently a lot of us will know deep down where our strengths and, and relative weaknesses are. So maybe you don't need a, a survey results. But yeah, it's, it's the idea of it is just to have it as a, an opportunity for people who might be interested to do it. To, it's, it's just to get people thinking and get people self-analyzing. It's amazing the uh, how easy it is just to roll through life never really stopping to think well what are my values and and thinking about it and I had this you know this experience in a job that I've uh, I did for, for three and a half years it was a medical director role that I've recently moved out of and in the last 18 months of it I found that I just you know wasn't getting much out of it and, and not enjoying my work as I had in the initial uh, setting and, and so that was a a catalyst for me to sit down and, and basically map out where my values were at at that stage in my life, whether those values were congruent with the what I could display in the workplace or, uh, you know, my role in the workplace and, and, and doing that, I mean, just even updating that, knowing my own personality and how that fits and what motivates me, uh, but doing these sort of things and, and, and it just made me realise, well, hang on, the, the problem here is that there's you know, my values aren't aligning with my current role here. And, and that causes this uh, sort of this incongruence that, that can then, you, you know, you're not getting as much as you could be out of your workplace. And, and that was, for me, the catalyst to say, well, okay, that's, that's good that I've identified that. What's next? Start to map out a, a strategy, an exit strategy from that role to move on to, to something new. And so it, it is all designed to promote thought. It's just an opportunity to reflect on on yourself and, and gain more insight and then if if people want to in, engage and have a look at what else we've got on offer or not even us have a look at what else anyone has to offer the, the whole goal is to try and break resilience down into into granular detail and tangibles that that the evidence tells us you can go out and build on a day-to-day -day basis 
So mm. don't just sort of float along, wait for things to go horribly wrong, fall in a heap, and then do an intervention to bring yourself back to baseline. This is about bringing it into focus, building resilience deliberately across mm. all the layers of your shield. So you're more resilient, less likely to fall in a heap if you have a big stress, or if you do fall in a heap, it's not going to be as profound as, as it might have been, is the, the goal here. Oh. That I love it. And I think, you know, at the risk of hyperbolizing things too much with the, the hundreds of clinic owners and business owners that, that we have the privilege of working with, uh, resilience seems to be such a differentiating factor. The, it, it's a high performance trait of business owners. It, it's such an underrated asset, um, not just for the average Australian, but for, for clinic owners and health professionals. So I think it's super timely. Uh, if I was to ask you, Dan, for the clinic owner that wants to foster resilience or cultivate resilience in their teams, if we want to lead towards resilience, what are perhaps some of the ways that we can that we can lead with resilience in mind? Yeah, good question. And the I think at the core of that is actually being resilient yourself is, <laughs> right is, is, put your own yeah. oxygen mask on first right i think we, yeah, we're a bit terrible as doctors at this it's the old do as i say not as i do type right. of thing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah they, they, they always say that the mechanics drive the, the crappiest cars and, and all the rest of it so uh -huh. but, but no i think it is fundamentally it's it's yeah exactly fitting your own mask first before you you fit others but but and and setting that example as well of course if you are in a position of leadership and people are looking up to you and you're telling them, hey, look, you know, knock off on time, make sure you get home, spend time with your family, and then you're still there at midnight. It's not setting the right example. So it's it's about setting that company culture. It's about, I think, just promoting the the awareness and and also just putting yourself forward as 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 a caring like not just paying that lip service and doing the the occasional reference to the employee assistance program or what have you but mm -hmm. but actually structuring time and and living the the philosophy and it's not easy it's not easy of course and it's there's always competing priorities for the sure. the, the the but and checking in you know, genuinely you know we we talk a lot about in the the social layer of the book about things like active listening and and about how you can have meaningful interactions with other humans across the board but just making sure that that's happening understand your people so everyone is going to come from a different baseline and that's the whole idea of the survey is to to be able to baseline individuals rather sure. than than the generic do this and you will become resilient, the cookie cutter approach, uh, which we, we, we're trying to, to not do. But so it's having an understanding of, of who these people are as individuals, taking an interest in them. And then if you have the insight into what the, the granular tools of building resilience are, and you have, you know that this particular person is is single, loves to travel, does this, does that, then that's a very different interaction you'd have with them than the dad of, of three with a, you know, with, with, with a wife and, and a sick mum living in a state, these kind of things. So, you know, knowing your team will, will allow you to be able to tailor the whatever needs to happen in the workplace, be it leave, be it remote work, be it this, be it the, uh, whatever's appropriate to the workplace to allow them to optimise their resilience. But I think just even, even checking in with them in a genuine fashion and actively listening and, and learning about your people is, and then living, living the uh, actual uh, philosophy yourself. To, what, to that end though, to what degree is the pursuit of resilience individual versus communal? I think it needs to start at the individual level, but then there's so many factors in the community that will bolster that resilience. And so the, certainly you, you can't outsource resilience to someone else and just turn up to work. And I guess the SAS Regiment's a, a good example of this. And it's, it's once again, uh, you know, Ben, Tim and I talk to this because we're most familiar with that environment, but it's, it's applicable across the board. The, there's a lot of factors and, and, where there was a, a lot of expectation put on us as individuals to be physically fit, to be professionally competent, to keep up with our professional development and, and to constantly uh, be at a, a certain standard that was imposed by the workplace but required that individual resilience. That said, they allowed us to, to train each morning for physically for a couple of hours, do PT. So, I mean, they, the workplace facilitated our access to, to physical training within work sure. time. And, and this is very unique to, to that environment. I'm not suggesting 
every business give their their uh, employees two hours. But but uh, so I mean there was there was the it it comes from those two different directions. The organisation needs to create an environment and create a culture where resilience is is it's a positive thing and it's a sort of healthy. It moves in the right direction and and not just there spruing about right. Okay, we're we're going to get fit and healthy and all the rest and then hold you know piss ups every Friday night and and I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing there's a time and place for all of that as well but but yeah so I mean it's it's it, it, it comes from both angles and and you need to but the organizational environment needs to be one that that promotes and facilitates and and lives a resilient type philosophy and then there is a responsibility for individuals to to pick that up as well it can't be one or the other I think there's some really good practical leadership elements in that. So thank you, mate. Um, if you could speak to two different types of clinic owners, what would your advice be firstly to the clinic owner who's battling? It, it might be going through their 17th lockdown and they're struggling to recruit and it's tough at home. What's your advice to that type of clinic owner? Oh, that's hopelessly tough. Yeah. And there must be plenty out there across the, the board, you know, that are, that are struggling with that. I think the, in those sort of, settings that just just pairing things back and i think that the tendency for us when we're under chronic stress is to the first thing that goes are the small positive lifestyle habits but the the thing is they are the things that are so fundamental in that time and and when you are under that chronic stress and your cortisol levels are chronically elevated and trying to to bolster you as a as a human unit from a physiological perspective they will interfere with your sleep patterns they're going to interfere with your your deep sleep your memory consolidation your rejuvenation your release of you know growth hormones and testosterone and all this so, i mean it sets off this cascade of and we talk at great length in the book about basically chronic stress is a it's a killer it's an absolute killer and it, it causes every disease under the sun more or less and and so i think in that situation the the tendency is to move towards maladaptive coping strategies and and so we you know you stay up all night you, you're looking at screens because maybe you have to to keep up with work you're getting big doses of blue light that you're not aware of your sleep patterns are shot because you're you're not able to unwind you don't have any strategies then leads to a temptation to to drink more alcohol than you should so you can get to sleep but that sure. has the effect of ruining your sleep patterns you wake up tired you drink more coffee than you normally would and and this perpetual cycle a bit of a downward spiral just goes on whereas if you can start making the once again the always a little further small incremental steps in the right direction to to look after yourself as a, a human unit first and foremost and this comes back to the picture your, your own mask first if if you're not looking after yourself as a person then you're not turning up to work the best version of yourself you're not you're not interacting with your family the best version of yourself and and so there's going to be these negative flow and effects and and so it's I'm not suggesting it's it's easy. Some of these maladaptive oh. coping strategies uh, are are easy and, and they work. Hey, they work. They are coping strategies. Alcohol is a great one. But but if you can start to wind back those habits and, and replace them with more positive uh, coping strategies and the gee the mindfulness meditation stuff. I know I know I harp on about this. I don't, I, I can't believe I, I, I'm hearing myself say it. <laughs> If, if 20 year old Dan had been told this, uh, I would have said, no, you got the wrong guy. But, um, the, you know, these are the sort of things that are small. And I'm not talking about kind of meditating for two, three hours a night or anything. This is 10 oh. minutes a few times a day uh, with a guided meditation, uh, sorry, a few times a week with a guided meditation app. But just a small practice we know can start to switch off the chronic stress response, small amounts of exercise. And, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day, if, if you're physically capable of doing high intensity type stuff, great, all the better. It's not hours and hours. It's not doing Iron Man's, but these small positive changes, uh, winding the alcohol down a little bit, winding the caffeine down a bit, wearing a set of blue light blocking glasses at night. These little things can add up to, oh, you got them there. Good yeah, on you. Got them. Awesome, Jack. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's these little things that are going to make you from a, a stress response perspective, uh, more resilient and then you're going to be in your best position to be starting to work out the the complexities of, of uh, negotiating the the environment that your business is in that's unreal advice mate thank you thank you so much and you know for the clinic owner who's uh who's maybe feeling good you know i think sometimes there's a tendency for us to 
um, to look down. But if, you, if you're thinking of the clinic owner that's thriving, that's uh, really growing their clinic, and they really do want to live out what we talk about at CM around leading inspired teams and creating amazing experiences for their clients and you know, transforming healthcare away from just service provision towards experiential and um, you know, becoming a clinic for good is the language we use, amplifying your impact. What would you say to those clinic owners who are like doing well and aspirational? How can they continue to progress with resilience in mind? Well, I think with with resilience, and that's a fantastic place to be, and I, I truly hope there's a bunch of your uh, listeners are in that position despite COVID. I'd love to think that. the the uh, I've always loved the philosophy. I can't remember where I came across it, but it might have been a doctor. I can't remember, but uh, it, it basically the, the principle was if you ever reach a certain point, you know, look look around and see who you can reach down and, and pull up to your level. You know, it's it's not about sort of hoarding that power or that knowledge. It's about sharing and disseminating. And and there's some some fascinating uh, literature surrounding just that that what seems like a very uh, well what is an altruistic uh, kind of philosophy is really uh, fulfilling as as individuals and particularly as you you mature and you you. And this this talks to what I was what I was mentioning before about just acknowledging the input that other people had into me. And so I guess from that perspective, you know, look at how you can share that. Look at how you might be able to benefit someone else. Look at someone else who might be in a similar position to where you have been in the past, and you've managed to solve that problem and help them solve it. You know, pass that information on if if you're in a position to do so. But I think also, you know, in, in acknowledging that resilience is a dynamic construct. And sure. while you might be up at the moment, that doesn't mean you're going to stay up. And it, it's a complex world. It's got a, a tendency to, to, you know, blindside you with, with something terrible. And, and so, you know, the, I think the just maintaining that resilience, being grateful and gratitude, mm -hmm. gratitude is huge and so positively uh, causative and correlative of resilience and acknowledging what you have and being grateful for what you have on a day-to-day -day basis and not taking it for granted that in this day and age of, of COVID and, and businesses going broke, that you're not. So I think all of that, and and I think if you if you truly sort of fixate on those principles and and with gratitude and, and, and optimism, but gratitude being a big one of them, looking at, at the, the, the half of your cup that's full rather than the half of your cup that's empty, then you start to come across as that person and, and that in effect, through that sort of social contagion without you even trying. If you truly get into those practices and start living them, that mm -hmm. has its flow and effect, even in a, a non-verbal type way. You know, if you turn up and you light up the room, there's a good quote, I think uh, Tim, Tim Curtis, uh, one of the authors came up with it, in a, well, didn't come up with it, he's put it in our book talking about, you know, there's two types of people, ones that light up the room when they walk in and others that light up the room when they walk out. <laughs> so, so be, be the bloke that, that lights up the room when you walk in. Be enthusiastic. Another quote from the book from Eckhart Tolle, which uh -huh. uh, talks about, you know, your ego and enthusiasm can't coexist. And it's you know, drop the ego, be enthusiastic, get involved, try and help others and, and try and sort of let go of, of what the, the critics might think of you and, and just try and live your best life. And if you're in a position to do so, help others up to your level, help people solve a problem that you know the answer to and maintain your resilience uh, across the board and, and be grateful because you, you never know when, uh, unfortunately, life's going to throw you a curveball and, and you might be taking a hit. Spot on. Mate, uh, I'm just bloody grateful. <laughs> it's been unreal. Uh, thank you. Like I said, thank you for your... Positively correlated with resilience, Jack. Right, right. I can feel it. Uh, but no, again, thank you for your active service. Thank you for uh, your contribution uh, with the Resilience Shield and the book. Um, listeners, I can't encourage you enough. Please grab a copy. Grab it, Grab half a dozen copies and ah. share it around. It's uh, it's such an incredible, incredible resource. Dr. Dan Pronk, it's been an absolute privilege having you on the Grow Your Clinic podcast. It's been a real pleasure chatting, Jack. Thank you. And listeners, thank you for joining us. As always, head over to clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast for all the show notes, all the links to uh, connect with Dan, the other authors, the Resilient Shield and the books will be over there. That's clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for joining us for another episode and I can't wait to talk to you again really soon. Bye for now.